bed with a store clerk at the airport. As McCullough paid for his items, he inwardly resented the clerk's attitude. Because you see, she was talking on the phone while, he was, while she was ringing up his order. And then she proceeded to re return his change incorrectly. So McCullough decided he would just let her have it with both barrels. He lectured her, lectured on her on the importance of courtesy and the, the service industry and, and the degradation of the professional uh, standards in modern times. And the clerk, angry and embarrassed, put down the phone and replied to McCullough saying, I'm talking to my mother who lives out of town. She is elderly and she's sick and I only get to talk to her once, once a week. So you need to apologize to me for saying what you just said. Tell me you're sorry. McCullough apologized. He contemplated the encounter the rest of the day. He had accused the clerk of discourteous, discourteous behavior and had been just as guilty of being discourteous when he publicly lectured her. And he had contributed to the very thing that most aggravated him the most, the breakdown in public manners. It's hard to be patient. And sadly, it seems most difficult to show patience to those that we love, to our spouses, to our partners, to our friends, to our children, to our aging parents, to those who have difficulty navigating, whether it's with a walker or a cane or Alzheimer's or dementia. My husband, Gilbert, had dementia. His mother had Alzheimer's, his sister had Alzheimer's. And I watched how his family treated my husband because they could not understand he was not the man that they once loved, and yet he was. I always thought that whenever he did something, they thought it was, oh, he should know better than that. But he didn't. Not really. Whenever he wanted to talk, he had difficulties in spitting out his words. And I'd say to him, take your time. Because you see, he had primary progressive aphasia along with his dementia. It was in his head. He just could not get, get it out. But given him time, given him space, being patient with him, he could roll out the thought as though there was nothing ever wrong with him. But he needed patience. Someone who would take and give that to him. And I'd say to him, I've got all day long. I'll wait till you're ready. Patience. For many, many folks, patience is difficult. And yet, you see, patience can also be used as a success tool. If you're too impatient in your personal life, and then it would do great damage to your relationships. If you're impatient when you're on your job and your professional life, my goodness, you will make your more than your own shares of mistakes and it could probably damage your job. Patience. Patience is a tool. Have you ever heard of the uh, marshmallow test? 
Anyone? The marshmallow test was uh, was presented through a uh, it was a study through Stanford University, and then students were um, on a research team, and they were uh, were working with children ages four. And what they would do is that they would have a four-year-old in a room with some marshmallows. What fun would that be? Lots of marshmallows. And then the, the examiner, the person that was going to be examining them, would say to the child that, the, that uh, they would have to leave and, and run an errand. Now, if the four-year-old uh, could wait till the examiner uh, returned, why, well, that child could have two marshmallows. But if, if for some reason or other the child decided that they wanted a marshmallow right away and didn't wait, well, they could only have one marshmallow. While this poses a, quite a dilemma, this would be a dilemma for anyone at any age, even my age. But the interesting thing about it is that the children who were in this study developed all kinds of strategies to enable themselves to wait. They would, uh, they would sing songs, uh, they would tell stories, they would uh, play with their fingers, you know, children like to play with their fingers all the time. But what was most amazing is the impact this one character trait displayed at the age of four had on the lives of those who were part of the experiment. Stanford University research team tracked these children for many years. Those who were able to wait as four-year-olds grew up to be more socially competent, better able to cope with stress, and less likely to give up under pressure than those who could not wait. <coughs> and the marshmallow grabbers grew up to be stubborn, indecisive, more easily upset by frustration, and more resentful about not getting enough. And most amazingly is this. The group of marshmallow waiters had SAT scores that averaged 210 points higher than the group of marshmallow grammars. Interesting. Patience. Patience is an important quality in people. People who are not able to control their impulses, unable to to withstand the tedium, uh, to unwilling to allow others to progress at a different pace will make everyone around them unhappy and they will make many avoidable mistakes in their lives. And it's tragic, isn't it? It's tragic to allow that to happen. The writer of James gives us counsel. Be patient. Be patient. We need that counsel, don't we? We need it in our families. We need it in our workplaces. We need it when we're driving down the highway. My goodness, I could tell you all kinds of stories as I've traveled in lots of places around the world. We need patience in all of our human activities and our relationships. But however, James, James is really talking about something more specifically, a little bit deeper, a deeper kind of patience that he's talking about. He writes, be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the yield of its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord, the Lord's coming is near. 
The most lasting patience of all is patience that is rooted in the promise of God. Jewish psychiatrist Viktor Frankl experienced the Nazi concentration camp. And when he was arrested, he was stripped of everything, his property, his family, his possessions. The Nazis even forced the prisoners to give up their clothes. And Frankl had, he had spent many years researching and writing a book and his manuscript that he had written was hidden in the lining of his coat. And so when he had to give up his clothes, then that manuscript went with his book. And then he inherited the worn out rags that had belonged to an inmate who had been sent to the gas chamber. And Franco said, inside he found that he in inherited a, something very interesting. He said that instead of many pages of my manuscript, I found in the pocket of this newly acquired coat, a single page torn out of a Hebrew prayer book called, which, which contained the Shema, the daily Jewish prayer. The prayer that reads, O Israel, hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. He said that finding this torn page from the Jewish prayer book was, and having read the prayer, was a turning point in his life, and it gave him the strength to go on. Many people over 2,000 years plus have found that their faith gave them the ability to be patient under trying circumstances. The most lasting patience of all is the patience that is rooted in the promise of God. Amen? Amen. In his novel, The Simple Truth, the author David Bellucci portrays an encounter between a death row inmate and the prison nurse. The inmate, Rufus, was lying in the hospital bed in the prison infirmary when a nurse by the name of Cassandra offers to read the Bible to him. And he requests Psalm 103. As Cassandra reads the words, she notices that Rufus is silently reciting the psalm from memory. And so she asks Rufus about this, and he admits that he has memorized much of the Bible while serving out his prison sentence. And he had asked Cassandra to read to, read to him not for his benefit, but for hers. She seemed to be burdened with some anxiety, and he felt that she needed some inspiration. And with his encouragement, Cassandra sits for a moment and contemplates, contemplates on the, the challenges of her life. She's lonely, she's stressed out, frustrated with the complexities of raising her family, and, and as she pictures all of the things that drain away all of her energies, she reads once again these words from Psalm 103. Verses 2 to 5. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires <coughs> with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. In this drab, drab prison hospital, Cassandra compares her life to that of the 
death row inmate, and something in her is deeply touched by his concern. In scripture, Cassandra finds the patience she needs to deal with the circumstances. Today, we're offered a gift. We're offered a gift through James, and I offer it to you as well. Be patient, my brothers and sisters, be patient. Patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Be patient for the Lord is coming. And I might also add that the Lord is also here now as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive Holy Communion. Let us pray. Lord and gracious God, thank you for this lesson of patience. Thank you, Lord, that many times when you have asked and encouraged me to speak, that many times the lessons that you say that I need winds up that we all need it. So thank you for speaking to me as well as speaking to all who listen today. To be patient, to stand firm, to stand firm 